make her mad, she gets so mean. So <laughs> well, as you can tell, we're in for just a killer session tonight. And we're, we couldn't be more excited. Um, I'll make this brief because we got a lot of music and talking to get to uh, tonight. Uh, before we get started, my name is Seth Young. I'm the executive director of the Augusta Heritage Center. Um, here at Augusta, we're more than dedicated to bringing everybody quality traditional arts by any means possible during the pandemic. Of course, we can't wait for the day when we can learn again face to face and knee to knee and share a dance up in our famous dance pavilion. But until that time comes, know that Emily and I and everybody at Augusta are really um, working hard to bring you quality educational cultural content um, just by any means we can. And in fact, tonight is one of those silver linings because I don't know if we would have hooked up uh, you know, pandemic like the way that we um, Tonight's session is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, and the West Virginia Humanities Council. Uh, it's also facilitated by Davis and Elkins College in Elk Elkins, West Virginia. And of course, uh, we could not bring you this content without you, the generous supporters of the Augusta Heritage Center during this time. Uh, particularly those of you that are members of our winter uh, sessions. Uh, you've had a big hand in helping us continue our, uh, all of our operations un, uninterrupted uh, during this uh, really tricky, difficult to navigate times. Um, to introduce us to our featured artists tonight, I'd like to pass the torch over to Augusta Heritage Center's incredible artistic director, Miss Emily Mill. Hello, everyone. Yes, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Joey J. Say, who is coming to us from Chicago, Chicago based blues artist who um, has, has been making quite the splash on social media over the, the past several years, including this pandemic year. And um, we are. Joey, where I'm going to have, I'm not going to give you too much of his background because I'm going to ask him to tell us in his own words, but I will just let you know that there is some really great content that you guys can follow. Um, Joey's going to be dropping a single each month for the next several months um, on, on all of the, you know, all of the outlets, Spotify, Apple Music, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you have to get in the, you, you should just get in the front row and, uh, and follow him on Instagram to, to be able to see all that stuff. There's some really, really awesome content that he's posting. So um, I recommend that. And so I'm going to introduce you, I'm going to hand it over now to Joey. And I really want, I was hoping that we would start out this conversation tonight, getting to hear a little bit about how Joey got his start on uh, playing blues music in the Chicago area. So hi there. How's it going, Emily? Thank you for having me tonight. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think I discovered blues music when I think I was probably 14 or 15. And uh, at that time, me and my friend, we were into rock and roll, you know, like Foghat and Aerosmith and Zeppelin and all that good stuff. And uh, uh, we were always curious, always going through our parents' stuff and all that good stuff. Um, and we were going through his dad's uh, music collection. And we stumbled across like a, just like a big compilation uh, CD. And um, the first tune on it was a Memphis mini tune. And it was uh, Bumblebee Blues. And man, just hearing the crackling was probably enough for our ears. <laughs> um, and then right after that, I remember the next song after that was... Um, Muddy Waters. I can't remember which Muddy Waters tune it was. 
Um, but you know, that kind of, it, it kind of struck me a certain way because uh, it wasn't like ACDC and the other things that we were hearing, it was more simple, but there was just a lot of soul behind it. And uh, yeah, we just kind of uh, started uh, really exploring. And at that time, I don't even think I was playing guitar. I think I was just singing. Um, but just, you know, hearing that strain and Muddy's voice and Memphis Minnie's voice, it just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of took over and I'm, I'm still obsessed <laughs> to this day. <laughs> yeah, I've watched some great, uh, I've watched you play some great Memphis Minnie tunes uh, on YouTube. My daughter's joining us for a second. Um, uh, but yeah, you, sorry, could you play us a Memphis Minnie tune now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see what I got here. Yeah. from Memphis Mini is that uh, she'll take that same rhythmic pattern and she'll play it on different songs. So this song that I'm playing right now is Jockey Man Blues, um, but she does the same kind of uh, rhythmic idea for a song like a uh, Hoodoo Lady. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, stuff like that. And another Memphis Mini tune, um, well, which is just a little bit more exciting in terms of her technique and what she's doing is, uh, Butcher Man Blues, and that goes like. Butcher Man, Butcher Man, where have you been so long? Butcher Man, Butcher Man, where have you, I, I'd sing it louder, but you know, my, my neighbors here, I'm trying to please both parties here, you know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So Memphis Mini just was a super big influence on me in terms of how to approach uh, playing the acoustic guitar in a rhythmic way that uh, to me is still very exciting every time I hear it. Yeah. I, I'm curious on that, on that note, um, did you, did you learn her style um, by ear? Did you just sort of listen to what she was doing and then figure out what your fingers needed to do to copy that? Yes, um, exactly. Um, when I, um, pretty much when I try to learn songs, I just try to find the root note and I just take it note by note. And, you know, you might figure out where a note is on the E string or something like that. But um, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what note she's playing on each different string, just in case she's playing it in a different position. Um, as I started to learn more, I discovered, you know, guitar players play out of shapes. Uh, so that's why that kind of thing, you know, matters to, to get it note for note or at least something close to it, to that groove. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I was most uh, enamored with when I first started watching some of your YouTube videos was your right hand technique. 
And I, was it Memphis many, let me back up a little bit. You talked about, you know, uh, I think many of our journey, right? We listen to rock when we're young and popular, and then we follow that back to where that can try to get at the essence of what that energy is that we're attracted to. So when you were first uh, playing, I would imagine that you played with a pick. Did you play with a pick started? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. When and I then when was it, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to ask one follow-up and I'll let you riff on it. What, when, when was it and how did you transition from playing with a pick into the finger style that you're using right now? Wow, that's a really good question. Yeah, because um, I, I don't think that it was, um, you know, there was ever um, a single point in time um, where I was like, okay, I'm not gonna play with a pick anymore. Um, but, um, you know, I knew some local musicians um, while I was starting to play guitar more seriously. And um, a guy who goes by the name of Felix Reyes, uh, he recommended playing without a pick. And, um, you know, me being more into rock and roll and at the time more into electric blues, one of the people that I would play a lot to was T-Bone Walker. But seeing this local musician play T-Bone Walker, who is known to play with a pick and known to play with a guitar like that, you know, this guy, uh, Felix, was playing T-Bone with no pick at all. And that, to me, blew my mind, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, other than that, I probably just started playing with a pick or playing without a pick just when I couldn't find one of my picks, you know, because... 15 year old irresponsible me, you know, I was losing those things like hotcakes. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, well, I was curious, can you, can you talk a little bit, you talked also about Muddy Waters. Can you talk a little bit about his style and what has drawn you to him? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, you know, another guy who I met very early on while learning how to play was Kenny Smith, whose father played with um, uh, Muddy Waters, Willie B.D.I. B. Smith. So I had a lot of uh, a lot of influences telling me about who was playing with Muddy Waters, guys like Pat Hare, guys like Jimmy Rogers. So when I was listening to Muddy, I think very early into it, probably like after a month of listening to just pure Muddy stuff, I got really into Jimmy Rogers and I noticed the the very close connection between uh, what was going on. You know, you hear that, um, you hear that blues intro that Muddy will do in songs like uh, uh, Loving Man, where he's like. <laughs> you know, hearing intros like that, um, in Muddy's tunes, I'd go over to a guy like Jimmy Rogers and his music is just full of it from, uh, you know, all of his tunes like uh, My, Mach My Little Machine and uh, he's got a bunch of them. He's got that, uh, uh, the Who's Loving You Tonight song. I can't remember the, the name of it. <laughs> but um, Jimmy Rogers is just full of, uh, of that kind of stuff. And I think listening to Muddy, um, you know, Listening to him and Jimmy Rogers back and forth was very helpful for me to figure out how to really dig into it, how to how to do it uh, the right way, you know. So, like I was saying, like uh, that loving uh, loving man tune, you know. And Muddy would come in with his deep voice. Dog by women. That don't mean a thing. Dog by women. That don't mean a thing. Look, I'm loving. I've been rambling, rambling from town to town. Yes, 
Cause I've been rambling Rambling From town to town Look at I'm loving You know, so I'd listen to tunes like that, and then I'd go over to Jimmy Rogers, and I'd pretty much just figure out that it was the same kind of style, but that, you know, those guys had a way of playing the same thing, but always making it sound new. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my experience with, uh, with Muddy Waters, and listening to him also kind of took me to um, Robert Lockwood Jr. as well, because of those uh, early records um, that they have together. And that was just a very big delight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I, I love the I love the uh, uh, just thinking about you know young musicians' brain like looking at, and I think a lot of I, I love I think a lot of musicians have been on this journey of like, okay, well this person was influenced by this person and played with this person, and if I really if I look at all this music closely, I can I can figure out like how their brains worked to to make each of those songs their own it's, i love i love hearing hearing that journey in those words it's pretty cool absolutely yeah um well i'm curious um you mentioned a little bit about um like uh sort of getting in hearing hearing electric blues around chicago versus like that acoustic blues that you're, that you were starting to play. Um, and I know that you still play both. And I'm curious how those interact in your musical life or anything you wanted to tell us about those. Well, yeah, so um, I definitely play both and I don't, um, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, there's like no mindset that I have to like kind of switch or anything like that to, to get into it. And, you know, it's funny because, I mean, a guy like uh, like Jimmy Rogers and Robert Lockwood Jr., those guys as well played both. And sometimes they were playing the electric guitars um, as if they were acoustics, um, very rhythmically. And there's another guy that, um, that's very similar. His name is Stick McGee, who was Brian McGee's brother. And it's just amazing stuff, you know. Um, so for me, um, when I'm trying to you know, maybe build a set that incorporates both. I really just feel like, um, I don't really feel like the two things ever really clash. And I, I feel like actually, the more I play acoustic, the better I can uh, play electric, uh, you know, with no pick and building up rhythm. Um, there's, a, there's a song called uh, Drink Muddy Waters, which is um, a really good example of that, that uh, Stick McGee does. I highly recommend that version. Um, some people might see it as an acoustic song, but it's, it's an electric and I believe it goes like, here we go. stuff like that, where to me, I hear uh, that electric drive that's pushing it, but you know, it's technically played in a, an acoustic way, but you know, so that's a really roundabout way for me to say that, you know, I, I feel like the two are very close connected, especially if you're listening to the musicians who are coming from the forties and fifties, where it kind of seemed like, uh, you know, it's kind of like the wild, wild west, everyone's figuring out, you know, their own style and like, you know, what works for them. So yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, sorry, I think I think I'm gonna get interrupted one more time. Oh no, I hear the the voice is going back down the hallway. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm so, and when you're playing the electric blues, are you still finger picking or are you playing with a pick at that point? It depends, you know. Um, if I'm playing uh, electric blues, that's really just. Um, you know, like a, a guy like Ike Turner, like that style of music, um, I'll play with my hands because I, I love really digging into that. And sometimes a pick will do you a uh, disservice. 
But then there are guys like, you know, Bill Jennings and all the rhythm and blues kind of guys, you know, um, who are playing like swing music. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I will need a pick to play. Um, just cause you know, your fingers, your fingers, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> I'll just put it like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, um, there are a lot of artists who always remind me that I really don't need a pick. Like a guy like Clarence Gatemouth Brown. If you're watching his videos, it's absolutely insane watching uh, that, you know, both hands, both hands. But he's not using a pick, so it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> While we're in gear talk, I was curious if you could talk. I, I noticed that you have, like, a bunch of different uh, guitars that you play on on some of your stuff. I'm curious. Uh, if, if you wanted to tell us anything about your, your, uh, favorite guitars or your guitar collection. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, they're all my favorites. <laughs> you can ask my neighbors. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this one right here is a 1959, uh, national. So, you know, back in the day, a lot of Chicago blues artists couldn't afford the main brands like Gibson and Fender. So there was a company that would sell, uh, you know, affordable guitars. Um, and this is one of them, National. And uh, I play this a lot in some of my, um, in some of my posts, just cause I really like the feel. But I also have some acoustics right here that I could show you. Yeah. Um, this one. I got from a friend who found it in a, a basement of an apartment he had just moved in. And this is an Art and Luthery. And I actually really highly recommend these guitars because they're extremely cheap. But I mean, for an acoustic, for a good acoustic guitar, they're really cheap. But um, the quality for blues, it just uh, it feels so right for me, at least. And it's a very deep and thick sound. Well, that's, you know. So you've seen people ask about this one because it's got uh, all this kind of uh, wear and tear, but I didn't even do that. I, I got it like this, you know, and uh, it only cost me 50 bucks to have a sleeve of uh, Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> How did that negotiation go down? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he, uh, he wasn't looking for much money, so, you know. It was, a, it was one of my friends and uh, he played into my group and he just really wanted me to have it, but I didn't want to, you know, just take it from him. So I, you know, gave him uh, some money and his favorite snack. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. You've got mo the money and the love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I have this Gibson. Uh, I just got this actually not too long ago, sometime over the summer, I believe or uh, last spring and it's an L1. And I got this because this is the same kind of guitar that Robert Johnson played. And, you know, it's not to say I'm a huge, huge fan of him, but you know, that's just some classic music, classic style. And for me, sometimes when I'm picking up guitars, I really just want to experience some guitars um, that other people were playing to really kind of figure out like why they, you know, why they did certain things. Because, you know, if you've listened to Robert Johnson, he's doing a lot of interesting things. Um, I can't say that this guitar has helped me figure that out, but I just like it. I like the tone. Um, yeah, and it helps. And I, I also play a lot of country, too. Nice. So... They all have different tones, different uh, personalities, and um, yeah, you know, I just kind of play them. I'm, I'm not too much into into gear and getting uh, super, you know, particular about it. But I just I just play what I like. I wish I had my uh, my other uh, guitar here, uh, which is an ES5, just like Eddie Taylor. 
um, and T-Bone Walker as well too. And it's, a, it's, it's great for this kind of discussion about electric and acoustic. That kind of guitar for me, I feel like kind of fits uh, right in between for both styles. But yeah, so yeah, these are the guitars that I play, yeah. Nice. Uh, I love that. What was that last, that tune you were just picking? That's a, that's a jailhouse rag by a guy named David J. Miller. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's a very cool uh, Before we move on, can, can you pick a tune on that guitar? Man, you're going to steal a bass player's gig if you keep playing that guitar. <laughs> <on> the <gig. laughs> that's I'm <laughs> I, I I just want to, I wonder if I could request that you play one on that axe before we move on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a killer tone. I appreciate that. Yeah, here, let me. tune called hungry calf blues yeah wonderful if you're just joining us we're here with a chicago based blues artist joey say um we will be monitoring the chat in in both facebook and here on zoom uh, for any questions that you may have um and uh we do have some requests for some original songs uh, before we get into that and in your journey into that, I do have one more. I know we're getting into some like minutia of, of Joey's playing and style, 
But man, you really make the acoustic sing like you're in an open tuning, even though you're in, in standard tuning. And I just wonder if you ever, um, if that's your home base, have you ever done any open tuning? If so, um, what, um, I really mean that, like, you know, the way you're playing the bass hand and the way the shapes go, it, it sounds as though you're in G or D, um, which is quite an accomplishment. I, I, I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer to that is um, I do sometimes experiment with open tunings, um, but, you know, the stuff that really moves me is typically right out of a standard tuning or maybe they're playing a half step down or something like that. And, you know, there was a point, you know, where I was listening to a lot of Muddy Waters, a lot of Memphis Mini, as I had mentioned, a lot of Jimmy Rogers too. Um, and a lot of that stuff, you know, that I was hearing was in E. So I think for me, uh, um, when I had realized that, I wanted to figure out, you know, different keys to play in and how to leverage the open strings because if you're if you're playing in uh in e you know most people will do the little to to make them sound, sound a little bit more full where they uh will play the high e and b string uh in correlation with uh the low e and a string so like the low a and e string you'll be doing something like They'll add and stuff like, you know, stuff like that. I wanted to figure out how to do stuff like that in a different key, like A, like B. And that's what you're hearing on that uh, Blind Boy Fuller tune, where he's using those same, he's using those same open strings, but just uh, in a different key. And then he's got some shapes he's doing as well but you know it, it uh it just makes the guitar sound more full and uh i don't know you know it's just something that you know I, I like to do but i don't i don't play with um a lot of uh open tunings um and if i do it's more so for uh, a specific song so like uh, the other day i was just jamming to um poor howard by lead belly and i think that tuning is in like open F minor or something like that. Um, and you know, that stuff takes a while to figure out. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just kind of keep it, I keep it as simple as I can for myself because uh, that's a lot of stuff to hold in your head. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and I know Seth mentioned this and I, and I wanted to get to this too. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about your um, artistic influences and the songs that you learn from, from some of the older players, but I also know that you write stuff, write, tunes and the style and and I'm curious um sort of both your journey to writing original tunes and sort of where you um derive your your influences for that or your inspiration yeah and uh, here I'll pull out this other guitar to play some tunes but um you know for for my original music um a lot of people might hear it and they might not hear the influences right away but you know in my free time I really just play blues but um before I was really acquainted with blues music all the artists and styles and stuff like that I was already trying to you know mess around on the guitar and uh, make original music um so I think a lot of my influence for the originals comes from you know just way before um way before anything with uh blues and I was listening to, like I said, rock and roll, but I was listening to people I thought were great singer songwriters, like Carly Simon and um, John Sebastian and uh, Randy Newman even, you know, like I, I really dig that stuff. I really do from a, from a songwriter point of view. They're, they're great because they, they just know how to move you. But, um, they're, you know, once I started to learn how to play a little bit more, I try to make a little bit more of a conscious decision of how to insert my influences and um there's a country artist uh i believe his name is jerry reed who made the claw and jiffy jam and like stuff like that really appealed to me because i grew up on on country music uh my dad and uh, my dad just loves country music and uh i would try to make songs where i i want to have you know a bluesy feel but i also wanted to 
you know, have that little kind of country, uh, twangy kind of uh, approach to some of the originals. And the song that I'm thinking about is one of my originals called Feels Good. Because, um, you know, Jiffy Jam is in the key of E. It goes like something like. You know, something like that. But I took it and I try to do something with it. Um, in, in my song feels good and I'll play that for you right now. try to sneak in stuff like Jiffy Jam somewhere in the middle of the solo. Just little bits and pieces of it. It's a tough one. Every day change That's an original song, but it's really just full of uh, a lot of blues and jazz chords in there, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for that. I think we were all totally jamming out. Um, you know, one of the themes that has come up in, in some of these talks has been that a lot of um, 
early recorded blues musicians were also quite accomplished um, country musicians, but they were not allowed to record um, any of their country material because back in those days you had to be like one thing and one thing only and, and you know everything that was put out was really highly polished to what your image was going to be. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to see you so adeptly build all those influences into um, obviously your own unique style and your own unique songwriting. Um, very enjoyable. I, I don't know, <laughs> Emily, what else to say about it or where I'm going with it other than gushing about you. I like it. Yeah, no, no, totally. I, I also, I was thinking the same thing about the sort of overlap between, um, you know, the, the music that people, ha you know, in, in, in every generation, there's, you know, musicians often are playing multiple styles and yet, um, you know, you don't often, you only get to hear one side. And I think that was especially true in the early days of the recording industry. Um, can we hear another regional tune before we get you off in another direction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, this one's more of a ballad. Um, and once again, uh, kind of some, uh, a little bit of that country influence as well. Yes, you shine like a child Oh, I'm moved by your smile And somehow, no, you don't even know when you're close to me, I can hardly breathe. And somehow, now you don't even know. No, it's not my style to get so wild. But you set me free from all those things I used to be. Yeah. All the scars and the marks, no, they don't stop the sparks that are known to a heart. Yes, I'll take you as you are. All the lies that you learn to believe, they to see. Oh, learn to let them go. Oh, I want to see you grow. Yeah, you'll call me crazy for all of my honesty. Yes, you shine like a child. Oh, 
I'm moved by your smile Somehow you don't even know When you're close to me I can hardly breathe Somehow you don't even know That's a song of mine called um, called Shine, and you know, like it's 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 just nice to allow yourself to branch out into whatever genre you want to play, and you know, it's sometimes it's even really nice for the show because you'll be six, seven, eight blue songs uh, deep into it, and then you'll pull uh, you know one like that, and it really takes people by surprise. <laughs> yeah, that was gorgeous and gorgeous singing too. Thank you. Um, uh, I was so I was curious. And I, I've been thinking about um, your, uh, you know, I, I watched some of your live performances with a band and I know um, that this year has been so strange for musicians because of the, both the lack of gigs, but also just the lack of being around other players. I'm curious how, what, what you've been doing in this COVID year. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know that's a great point because at least for me, especially here in Chicago, what I really enjoy and love about this city is being able every single night uh, to go uh, not play, not only play yourself, but be able to be amongst musicians, play with musicians, play for people, feed off of that you know vibe and everything. And it's been tough. I'm not gonna lie because there's really no substitute for that. But um, for me personally, I just wanted to do more of a deep dive into certain uh, records. And I've been discovering just a lot of awesome uh, artists myself and new sounds. So, you know, for me, um, you know, I obviously, I, I call all my musician buddies and we talk on the phone for hours and hours and hours and play through the phone as well too. That's always fun. Um, but for me, I think it's been a lot of, uh, just a lot of listening. Because I think a lot of people who play guitar just forget that you can't play what you don't hear. And, uh, you know, you're not going to hear it if you're not listening. So I think I've been doing a lot more listening lately and investing in a lot of vinyls. Um, because some stuff you can't really just, uh, you can't really look it up online, some of these uh, artists and some of their pieces of work. I will also say that I'm very fortunate because right down the street is Bob Kester's record shop. And Bob Kester used to uh, own Delmark Records. Um, so he knew all those artists like Magic Sam, The Aces, Robert Lockwood, and so on, so on. So I've, you know, I, I don't go anywhere because of this pandemic and stuff, but that's been the only place I allow myself to go. Um, and it's been, it's been awesome because it just puts more just amazing music in my ears. So, yeah. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Um, well, we've you're getting a lot of comments on the Facebook of this is so wonderful. You're so great. Um, and and yes, a lot. Of, oh, yeah, I, I react. There was um, Reed commented, you can't play what you don't hear. Amen, which I totally agree. Like, yeah. that's a really, really great um, reminder for I think for musicians in every <laughs> like playing any instrument um or singers you know you really can't can't do what you don't hear i love that um but i think i wanted to i wanted to mention and if anyone has any other questions um feel free to drop them in the chat but i wanted to mention that joey did record three lessons for our augusta winter sessions um beginning intermediate and advanced um blues guitar so uh Winter Sessions members, you can hop on the AugustaArtsAndCulture.org website and um, take those lessons if you haven't already. I know we already have a lot of people who have already dived into those um, those lessons, but um, and it's not too late to join to you. There's still another um, another two months essentially of of the Winter Sessions um, lesson availability. So if you haven't joined and you'd like to take lessons from Joey, and also um, John Tavius Willis has some blues guitar lessons, um, and and of course, and then there's some wonderful other things that you could explore as well, including vocals and all sorts of things. So um, 
and bluegrass guitar if you want to expand your mind and learn some flat picking as well. So you, you can still stop by at augustaartsandculture.org and sign up for those winter sessions if you want to, to hear more wonderful Joey J. Um, and I also wanted to say that, um, I wanted to remind you if you didn't hear at the beginning, Joey is releasing some new music right now. He's dropping singles um, each one a month um, coming up soon. So the best way to be on the front uh, in the forefront of that exciting new music coming out is to follow him on Instagram and or Facebook. Um, and then you'll know when the singles are coming out and you can follow him, catch his, catch his coattails as he's rising up. Um, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Seth, did you have any other, uh, any other questions that, that you wanted to ask before I asked Joey to play us out with one or anything you wanted to add of course there's probably some things well, uh, yes <laughs> um uh you hit the nail on the head emily i i've been thinking about joey's three wonderful lessons for our winter sessions um the only thing i'll add is anybody interested in the augusta heritage center uh, you can email us um through our website augustaartsandculture.org um, if you message the Facebook page, you're either going to get Emily or I. If you message Instagram, you're going to get Emily and I. And I'll tell you that uh, it seems like the world changes about every four days right now uh, in these times. And we're constantly changing with it. Um, and I want to reiterate our dedication to bringing you quality traditional arts content. Um, we have safety first mentality. But we do believe the best way to learn is face-to-face -face and need to need. And you better believe as soon as we can get Joey on the campus of Davis Oakland College, we're, we're going to. Um, because the, these times are so turbulent, uh, things switch around quite a bit. And if you want to keep up with the latest about what's happening at Augusta, a great way to do that is to join our email list. It really is um, the quickest way to, that we do communications. So uh, if you want to drop email in the chat, private message on Facebook, Instagram, anything. We can add you to that, that list and uh, let you know all the goings on uh, that, that are going to happen. Uh, we have many plans <laughs> for this summer. And our plan A is that we do meet in person. We do, do know that that um, is all dependent upon uh, things that are out of our control. Uh, so we're going to proceed with a safety first mentality, but also with a mentality that we will be bringing um, traditional arts education to all of our participants with whatever tools are in our tool bag here in the near future. Um, if you have joined us, uh, we've put a survey in the chat, both here on Zoom and over on Facebook. Um, this session is sponsored by the West Virginia Humanities Council. Uh, they've been very uh, generous in sponsoring these fact. Uh, sessions and beyond flexible with allowing us to continue uh, our projects in a completely new format. If you like um, th this content and you want to see more like it, uh, it really does help us out if you fill out, fill out that quick survey. It also helps the West Virginia Humanities Council out because they turn those surveys in uh, to the um, NEH, the National Endowment for Humanities. So it helps both organizations continue to bring uh, quality content like this. We're also sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, uh, we're by Davis and Elkins College. And most of all, we have to thank you. Uh, there have just been hundreds of individual donors come out of the woodwork uh, since we had to make the, the quick pivot to an online format. Um, in March last year, if I'm remembering correctly, Emily. And because of that, there's been uh, a whole new world that we've entered into. We're able to host lessons on our own online learning platform. Uh, we're able to document these cultural sessions and save them for later. Things didn't happen. And there is a lot of great work going on at the Augusta Heritage Center right now as far as digitizing the archives. For, uh, there, we just digitized our 300th tape out of um, the archive since September. We have to thank our AmeriCorps Hannah Fuller, man. She has just been churning out that digitization uh, process. 
I should also mention another great way to keep up to date with Augusta Heritage Center is to join our private Facebook group, Learn, Create, Connect, Augusta Heritage Center. That's a great way to keep up with everybody. It really is an online Facebook community. Uh, that is enough thank yous and talking from me. Uh, thank you very much. Joey, thanks for being here today. We found each other the old fashioned way over the internet and I could not be happier than we did. Man, are you just a powerhouse of, of, of everything. I love your style, man. I love your original tunes. Um, thank you so much for your lessons and, and for your insights here today. And I'm just wondering, I guess, as our time ends, if you could play us out uh, with maybe one of your early blues influences in that finger picking style that I just love that, how you do. And Absolutely. One, one thing, there, there, there was a question that came in on the Facebook and uh, maybe this will tie in, I don't know. But uh, Rochelle asked, who would be your dream blues collaboration? Huh. Uh, with someone who's alive? I, I don't know. I think you could take that in any direction you want. Man, oof, you know, this is stuff I literally have dreams about. But I, I'd say, you know, uh, you know, I'm probably either Robert Lockwood Jr. or um, Bill Jennings. Uh, I just think they're such fabulous musicians. And uh, yeah, I, 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 oof, I would learn so much from five minutes sitting down with them. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just say my thank you as well, Joey. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I agree. Let's let's hear hear you out on one more, and then we'll we'll end the meeting after that. Absolutely. Here we go. <laughs> In this world of trouble, you're a friend of mine. In this world of trouble, you're a friend of mine. Life is good when I make you smile. In this world Trouble, ain't no need to cry. In this world of trouble, ain't no need to cry. You got a home, long as I got mine. Thank you to my new friends over at Augusta. Thank you guys so much for having me tonight. How <laughs> fabulous. Thanks so much and good night, everybody. We'll see you all soon.